Welcome to episode 14 of the Quantum Science Seminar. Today is all going to be about atom arrays. And uh, as usual, we do take your questions. Please send your questions to us via uh, email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com, or you can put them in the uh, YouTube chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. Um, we're going to take a break somehow half through the, halfway through the talk to uh, start answering some of those questions and answer the rest of the questions at the end. Our speaker today, Antoine, has also very kindly agreed to answer all of your questions uh, that we may not be able to get to, in case there are too many, um, in written form that we will then put on the web page uh, later. Please also note that uh, there is a 30-second time delay between what uh, we're doing and what you're seeing, and please take that into account. And with this, I will hand over to Sylvain, who will uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, yes, thank you. So it is uh, today my pleasure to introduce uh, Antoine. Uh, so Antoine is working as a CNRS uh, research director at Laboratoire Charles Fabry, uh, which is a part of the Institute Optique in Palaiso nearby Paris. And he's a specialist of light matter interaction in mesoscopic uh, ensembles of atoms. In particular, he investigates collective effects of light matter interaction in the regime of high atomic densities. And he also pioneered, uh, together with Philippe Grangier, the trapping of individual atoms in optical tweezers. And since then, he obtained very impressive results on, for example, the study of dipole-dipole interactions between distant uh, Rydberg atoms, and more recently, the generalization to many body physics in atomic arrays in the Rydberg blockade regime. And today we will present uh, several very nice projects on this many body physics with individual atoms. So I hand over to you, Antoine. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and a big thank to the organizing team for setting up this uh, very nice series of seminars and also for giving me this privilege to be part of uh, one of those speakers. So uh, indeed, what I'm going to uh, discuss during the next uh, 45 minutes or so are some experiments uh, on the many body physics using arrays of uh, individual either Rydberg atoms or atoms uh, for which we consider their optical dipoles instead. So all this is work done at the Institute Optique, as uh, Sylvain said, and actually the Institute Optique, despite the Eiffel Tower shown here, is actually not in Paris, but uh, it's 20 kilometers south of Paris on the campus of uh, the Université Paris-Saclay. And so before I actually uh, dive too quickly into the topic, let me just introduce the team who did the work. So essentially all the people that you see uh, on this group uh, picture contributed to the work I'm going to report. Uh, so there are uh, two CNRF staff members, so junior ones, uh, Igor and Thierry, that probably many of you know, uh, that are responsible of uh, each project we have in the group. And the work was done by a lot of team of talented PhD students and postdocs. So we had Antoine, Pascal, Vincent, and Kai as PhD student, and the postdoc, Giovanni, Nicola, Anna, and uh, Daniel who has been with us for quite some time. Uh, we have also a research engineer that we share uh, between groups at the Institute of Optique, and we did a lot of uh, technical work in our group that was uh, very important to us. Very importantly, uh, as you will see uh, in uh, during the talk, we do many body physics and most of us have actually a background in AMO physics, uh, which means that we are not specialists of the many body problems and we need to have the strong support of theorists uh, as is now uh, usual in this field. And we received for what I'm going to discuss, the theory support of Andreas Leuchli in Innsbruck and Hans-Peter Büchler in Stuttgart. And I will show you uh, the contribution that they had during the talk. All right. So the general framework of what we do as uh, really many, many groups around the world those days is to study many body physics uh, using synthetic matter. So the goal of many body physics, loosely speaking, is trying to understand the properties of an ensemble of interacting quantum particles. So here on this slide, I have a few iconic situations which fall into these categories so superfluidity, superconductivity, magnetism. So they all belong to this class of quantum matter physics problem. But of course, it also spans much larger areas, such as uh, high energy physics, nuclear physics, or even astrophysics with this uh, neutron star uh, business. So uh, the kind of question that people ask, and of course, we know a lot uh, about those condensed matter physics uh, problem, but uh, still, there are a lot of questions that are very hard to, uh, to solve. 
The kind of open question that we have in some instances are we don't even know the phase diagram of these uh, systems, which is to say the ground states. Uh, if we place them out of equilibrium, it's very hard to calculate the ensuring dynamics following this quench of a given parameter, because doing any ab initio calculation beyond 40 or 50 particles is impossible, which is not to say that we don't know anything about the system, but it's hard to calculate uh, certain uh, situations. Also, uh, some questions that have ar arisen more recently are the role of topology in uh, condensed matter physics or in many body physics. The role of disorder that I've been investigating a lot uh, through transport measurements. And also some questions that traditionally did not belong to the realm of uh, condensed matter physics, but uh, that are now uh, creeping in uh, with the eyes of quantum information uh, concept. And so this is the role of entanglement in these many body systems. As all these questions are very hard to answer conceptually and uh, theoretically, I mean, people have suggested this idea, I mean, prompted by this uh, suggestion of Richard Feynman, to use the experimental control that we've gained over the years uh, to build artificial quantum matter. And this artificial quantum matter implement some kind of many body Hamiltonians that you are in fact, interested in. Those Hamiltonians may be idealization of real life situations, but they can also be purely abstract mathematical ones. So in a sense, very much like the chemist uh, build their own uh, devices or a product and then study them. Uh, you want to study some kind of magnetic oxide whatsoever. We in AMO physics can now design our own many body system and study it. The great, greatest set of this approach is that it has a very large uh, tunability and quite often much larger than any real system. I mean, it's out of question uh, to vary any parameter on a neutron star where well, you can obviously vary the interaction strength, the interparticle distance in a many body system. So when we speak about many body system, kind of the simplest one we have in mind, because it's usually the first one we encounter in our studies is a spin model. Uh, so let's just take a, an ensemble of spin 1f particles that we pin on a, on a lattice. And uh, so usually you can write Hamiltonians to describe the interaction energy between this. And I mean, they fall in various categories, but one popular one is called the Ising model. So this is a sigma z, sigma z uh, term. So sigma z is the usual Pauli matrices describing spin 1f system. And this Hamiltonian is essentially telling you that if two atoms are of the same orientation, two spins have the same orientations, then they will have an energy which is different than if they have uh, with opposite spin. A second type of Hamiltonian that people uh, write uh, is uh, the X, uh, what is called a flip-flop Hamiltonian. This is a sigma plus sigma minus type of Hamiltonian, where essentially the action of this uh, operator, this Hamiltonian, is to flip or to interchange uh, the spin uh, state. Okay, so all these Hamiltonians have been introduced in various contexts. I mean, usually we learn that through magnetism. Uh, but you can also encounter that in many different uh, areas, such as uh, the transport of excitations. So I just give you a few examples here. It may become a bit clearer later during the talk. But for example, if you want to understand photosynthetic process, I mean, you may simulate that by excitation that propagates from side to side, driven by this XY model. If you want to study light scattering, I'll come back to that at the end. That's also one situation which can be described by this time of flip-flop Hamiltonian. The transport of excitation to, uh, through a polymer, for example, is also another uh, case where uh, you use the flip-flop Hamiltonian. So, of course, now, if you want to build this artificial many body system, you need some kind of, uh, of hardware to do that. And usually uh, people have come up with uh, many of them and uh, a lot have been actually uh, discussed during this seminar series, but there is this whole categories of artificial atoms. It can be superconducting circuits, it can be quantum dots. You've got all the AMO, traditional AMO physics uh, systems, such as molecules, ion, atoms that you place in optical lattices or not, uh, that you can interact through magnetic interactions. Photons are also other examples. And so what I'm going to discuss here is our particular platform. And so our particular platform is uh, an ensemble of atoms that we place in arrays of optical tweezer. So these all start with uh, just a single laser beam, which we will call the tweezer which is focused over a size of typically one micrometer by a large numerical aperture lens. 
And in this trap, which is a dipole trap, it's a laser beam focused, we can trap one and only one atom. And so this uh, was actually realized by Philippe Grangier, so and pioneered by Philippe Grangier at the Institute Optique around 2000. And since then, many, many groups have uh, optical tweezers in their lab. So these optical tweezers is filled usually by a reservoir of cold atoms. So it's a magneto-optical trap. So it's, it's an ensemble of cold atoms that acts as a reservoir. And at the same time as the atoms enter randomly in this trap, essentially because of the laser cooling light, they do fluoresce. And therefore you can collect the fluorescence light on a CCD camera and measure the position of the atoms. So now if you want to have many of these traps, what we rely on here is diffraction. So essentially we imprint a phase on the laser beam, which is going to ensure the trapping. And what we have in the focal plane of the lens is the Fourier transform of the phase factor we have imposed. So if we impose this kind of phase transform, a phase pattern here, we've got a given Fourier pattern. So an ensemble of dots. And so I'm going to sweep now a lot, a lot of very interesting and, and, and technically involved details uh, about the experimental method, but essentially what we can have at the end are arrays of atoms. And these arrays of atoms are completely assembled, they are defect free. And so here you've got an example of single shot images, uh, fluorescence images of atoms. So essentially you can arrange those atoms in 2D plane with a hexagon uh, type of configuration. This kind of 200 uh, traps that are kind of put in this kind of snake or this kind of line. There is this kind of funky figure here. So if you wonder what this is about, actually the original is this. So it's kind of a pixel-like version of the Jocon. Uh, but you see that we can manipulate now daily in the lab a few hundred atoms uh, that can be assembled in any uh, particular configuration with a typical interparticle distance on a few micrometers, a length scale. We can also arrange them in three dimensions. So this is an ensemble, an example of average images. So basically each of the dots here corresponds to one atom which is trapped in this 3D structure. So this kind of Fullerene-like structure or this kind of nice uh, Eiffel Tower. So this is the platform we're going to use. And with this, I'm going to discuss three different topics essentially. The first one is going to be an investigation of a quantum magnetism by the implementation of the Ising model using the van der Waals interactions between Rydberg atoms. Then I will use the second kind of interactions that naturally uh, uh, arises in with Rydberg atoms, which is the resonant dipole interaction, which I will introduce, in order to realize topological matter uh, in one dimension for what I'm going to discuss today. And then I will again use these resonant dipole interactions, but now in connection in conjunction with uh, optical dipole in order to study collective light scattering. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is uh, quantum magnetism. And I should point out that what I'm going to discuss is ongoing work uh, that we're doing with Andreas Löschli in uh, Innsbruck together with his student, uh, with no postdoc, actually Michael Schuler. So once again, we start from this array of, uh, of atoms. They are separated by a few micrometers, which is to say that each of the atoms here do not interact in their, in their ground state. Essentially, the interaction is completely negligible at this large distance. So we need a way to make them interact. And so this is this idea, which was initially suggested by Peter Zoller and Michel Lukin uh, 20 years ago already, to promote the atoms to a Rydberg state. It's a highly excited state with a very large principal quantum number and for which the classical picture is the one which is described here. So essentially a nucleus and the electrons which spirals very far from uh, this nucleus. Very far meaning a few hundred nanometers. So it's really an almost macroscopic, a mesoscopic at least object. The consequence of having such a separation between the plus and minus charge is actually twofold. The first one is that the lifetime of a Rydberg state is fairly long. This is typically 100 microseconds. So it may not look very long to you, but actually it's much longer than if you were in the, in the lower state on an optical transition. And you'll see that it's enough uh, in a minute. The second very important feature, which we're going to use heavily today, is the fact that because of this large separation between the plus and minus, actually there is a large transition matrix element in the, in the atoms, which scales like the, sca the square of the principal quantum number. So the consequence of that is that two Rydberg atoms will undergo very large dipole interactions. And so a number to remember is that if you split them, you separate them by about 10 micrometers, the typical strength of the interaction is above a megahertz. 
So it means that any dynamics which is driven by the interaction occurs on a time scale which is sub-microsecond. So you can see now why this 100 microsecond is essentially infinite for us because the interaction is, occurs at a much faster uh, time scale. So, I mean, as I said, it was all the ideas of uh, Michel Lukin and Peter Zoller initially, and uh, Mark Safman is probably the first experimentalist who took this idea seriously in the context of quantum information. And since then, there are a growing number of groups who have joined uh, all these ideas. Okay, so now what about the, the interactions between Rydberg atoms? I mean, this is dipole interactions for sure, but actually they can lead to two kinds of different interactions, the Van der Waals interaction and the resonant dipole. So let's first talk about the Van der Waals interaction. The Van der Waals interaction is the natural one that occurs if you place two, Rydberg, two atoms in the very same Rydberg state. Then in this case, the doubly excited state, so let's say each atom is in a Rydberg state n l equals zero in spectroscopic notation, the consequence of the interaction is just an energy shift by an amount which is C6 over R6. So this doubly excited state is shifted by this quantity. And the thing which is pretty uh, wild is the scaling of the C6 coefficient with the principal quantum number. It scales like the 11th power. So essentially, it means it's a switchable interaction. If the atoms are both in their ground state, they do not interact. Only one excited, it doesn't interact, but the two excited, they interact. And so if you want to describe this by an Hamiltonian, usually what you write is a C6 over R6 times N1, N2, which are the uh, Rydberg occupation number. So unless the two of these numbers are equal to one, the interaction is negligible. And that's exactly uh, translating this uh, diagonal shift here. So now, of course, you need to excite the atoms from their ground state, where they naturally lie, uh, to the Rydberg state. And this is done through laser excitation. So we use a two photon transition. We start from the atoms optically pumped in a given uh, uh, ground state manifold, so that we very well uh, know. Then do a two photon transition piling a blue on a red, uh, red laser, and we end up, so off resonant with respect to an intermediate state, and we end up in a very well targeted Rydberg state. And all the laser beams are always, in our case, covering the entire array as much as we can. So now, for any practical purpose, purposes, you can completely forget about the fact that those are two lasers. And we're going to ignore the details of the, uh, the, the AMO uh, physics of the problem and just say, well, the ground state is spin down, the upper state is spin up, and they are just coupled by this uh, Rabi frequency omega, this coupling. So now, if I want to describe uh, the ensemble of atoms, such as the one in this array, each interacting via a Rydberg uh, interaction van der Waals C6 over R6, I can write an Hamiltonian where I initially have, I first have the coupling by the laser, which is this omega over two times sigma x, the poly operator, which couples down to up, plus a term which is related to the detuning of the laser here, and plus this term of the dipole, uh, the, the van der Waals interaction. So essentially, I have the three terms that are needed to describe a quantumizing light model. The first one is the equivalent of a spin in a transverse magnetic field. The second one of a longitudinal field, uh, longitudinal magnetic field. And finally, this is the spin-spin interaction. Experimentally, we can vary the parameters on the experiment. So we can vary the strength of the interaction with respect to the transverse field here, which is the part that makes this a quantum. Then we can vary that from non-interacting to strongly interacting. So I'm just going to give you one example of things that uh, we're working on at the moment, which is to prepare two-dimensional uh, antiferromagnetic uh, ordering in a square arrays. So let's consider this array here in a square configuration. Okay, and I will uh, denote by this, gray, this uh, gray dot uh, the atoms in their ground state. We will choose the parameters of the Hamiltonian in such a way that the atoms appear essentially like our sphere when they are in Rydberg state in such a way that I cannot excite two atoms within this sphere. So it's kind of a hard sphere with a, a, this um, radius, which is given by this dotted line here. So it means that I cannot bring two atoms very close to uh, each other. So and the, the blue dot here, it means the Rydberg excitation. And then I can ask myself, what is the densest packing I can get when I add uh, I add into, uh, excitation in this system and that there is no uh, extra energy cost. So the ground state of this looks like this staggered configuration where I have every other lattice site, an atom which is excited to the Rydberg state and uh, in the ground state for the other uh, array. Obviously, I have two such configurations. It is degenerate. I can have the one staggered array or the second one. 
So as a matter of fact, this problem can be described a bit more generally by a phase diagram uh, where you vary the two exponential parameters, which are the equivalent of the longitudinal field and the transverse field. So delta is the longitudinal field, omega is the transverse field. And it turns out that for this Hamiltonian, you have a region of paramagnetic ordering, where essentially the spins would follow the effective magnetic field, separated by a, a quantum phase transition, a second order one, to the antiferromagnetic phase. So inside this dome, you would have antiferromagnetic uh, phase. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to try to adiabatically prepare the ground state of this state, we, uh, of this uh, system. So essentially this kind of staggered uh, configuration. And the way we do that is by using this kind of adiabatic principle where you can connect two ground state by varying the parameters in the Hamiltonian. So essentially omega and uh, delta. Uh, so we move in this uh, phase space in this way. Okay, so essentially we initialize the atoms all in their ground state, turn on adiabatically omega and delta, and then end up in this uh, antiferromagnetic state, hopefully. So let's do the experiment. We start with an array of a 10 by 10 uh, atoms, so single shot image, uh, almost, I mean, absolutely perfect uh, ordering. We sweep the, uh, the, we sweep the, the lasers and we end up with this kind of configuration. So this configuration actually seems to indicate that there are some missing atoms. You've got this kind of checkerboard configuration and indeed there are missing atoms. The reason why there are missing atoms is because of detection schemes maps uh, missing atoms onto the excitation of a uh, Rydberg atom. So essentially here you would have a Rydberg atom in the uh, conjugate uh, uh, lattice if you wish. And so the thing which is very nice is that this is exactly what you want. Here you've got a perfect anti-ferromagnetic ordering, a nail state on a single shot of the experiment. This doesn't occur all the time, of course, and because the preparation is hard to get completely adiabatic, but it works one shot every typically 500 shots. Now you can repeat the experiment many, many times and uh, average this and construct correlation functions. So this is an example of the correlation functions that we obtain in these arrays. So essentially the correlation function tells you what's the probability if I, were, I have a the given configuration of spin up to have another one up, down or up or down. Okay, so this is uh, this alternance of positive correlation when the two are up and negative, which corresponds to the blue. And you do see that indeed there is a perfect antiferromagnetic ordering over the entire array. It slightly decays though, and you can extract the correlation length in this array. And this correlation length uh, scales exponentially actually as a lattice side, and you find out that it's 12 lattice sides. So essentially it's larger than the size of the array, not by much, but it's uh, at least on the, the size of the array. And so uh, this is what we're working on at the moment. And uh, essentially it shows already that using this system, you can study this quantum phase transition and uh, this phase diagram. People have done it in 1D, obviously, and Michel Lukin has done a lot of work. We've done some early works in 2D previously. And so the kind of thing we're working on right now is trying to extend these studies to the case where you've got frustrated geometries. I'm not going uh, to give you any details about that, but essentially, instead of starting from a square, we would start from a triangle array for which uh, there is uh, supposed to be massive uh, ground state degeneracy. So that's what we're working on. I think that maybe I should pause here just for a minute uh, before I change uh, the type of interaction we're going to look at and see whether there are questions or uh, comments that uh, we could discuss. Well, thank you, Antoine. Um, yes, we do have um, a question um, from uh, someone, Bill Phillips. Um, let me read that. So there is this uh, continual tension between the desire to simulate a macroscopic many body system and the limited experimental ability to have many particles. So that experimentally one always has a mesoscopic system. Could you comment on the issue of being big enough and especially for seeing topological effects which are fundamentally non-local and yet often you see them uh, with small number of particles? Oof. Okay, so the second part, I don't know what to answer yet and the topology we're going to tackle in the next part. Uh, the thing I can say is that obviously having mesoscopic uh, system, uh, I mean, if you have too small a system, edge effects are uh, prominent. And so that was an issue. And uh, for a long time, the kind of uh, array, uh, two-wither array platform was limited to a few tens of atoms. So for this, if you want to study bulk physics, such as the one I'm presenting right now, uh, it was an issue. 
so now we have extended already kind of a lot. And so we can start to study bulk physics, like the kind of correlation function uh, I'm describing here. Um, sure, depend a bit on the edge, but not that much. So, I mean, sure, the, the goal of all these uh, systems is trying to enlarge the size of the system as much as we can. And so it's kind of realistic to be at a few hundred. We're already there. Extend much beyond, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think I have anything very smart to add here. Um, for sure, you need to have a large enough system that bulk physics can be separated from surface physics. And so that's the reason why it became kind of important to have arrays which are uh, larger than a few hundred. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Philly, Bill Phillips is happy with this answer. I don't think so, but... <laughs> um, I do have a question. Um, do you see any effect uh, for a uh, finite time uh, sweep in these uh, type of experiments? Uh, do you see domains, for example, or something like that? Yes, we do. And with actually what we are looking at at the moment. So it is very clearly there are some creation of defects. Those defects have structured. Uh, structure and so we are trying to characterize them. I mean, it's obviously very hard to be completely adiabatic, all the more than the system size is large, obviously. And so it means that all the gaps are closing. Uh, fortunately, for the array, they do not close too quickly with the number of atoms, so there is still a kind of room to, to, to creep in and be still kind of adiabatic. But yes, indeed, the physics of defect is very interesting and is a way to uh, study the quantum phase transition. So that's what we are doing. I mean, Michel Lukin has done it actually in one dimension already uh, through the kibble zurek mechanism in this. And so we have also tried to do that. And I think they have also uh, in 2D. So, But it's actually more subtle in 2D than it was uh, in 1D, it seems. So. And uh, maybe a short question um, uh, um, before we continue um, about the feeling factor, which you, I think, did not discuss um, so um, is it always the case that all the atoms are there in the array? Yes, we exactly. Yes, it's always the case. I mean, uh, we can prepare this assembled array. So I've completely neglected all the important uh, technical details. Uh, but essentially, uh, we can prepare arrays with 98, 99% filling. And so we can easily post-select on the arrays where you're absolutely sure that you start with uh, all the atoms in. And that, that happens 99% of the time. So. Thank you, Antoine. All right, so um, I guess uh, then we're going to uh, move to the second part, uh, which is actually trying to look at uh, topology in uh, this system. But here we are not going to use the uh, Ising interaction. We're going to use the resonant dipole interaction, which I will introduce. So it's all again using Rydberg atoms. So this is, again, the structure of the atoms we are considering. So I may have uh, neglected to indicate that we're using rubidium atoms. So this is an alkali. Uh, so this is, again, the structure that we've discussed. Uh, and uh, I should uh, say that for the rest now, we're going to totally neglect the low-lying part of the spectrum and only consider those two Rydberg states, S and P. So P uh, means L equals zero, S uh, L equal, sorry, P uh, L equal one and S L equals zero. Those two states are connected by a transition in the 10 gigahertz uh, region, six to 17 gigahertz. And kind of importantly, they are coupled by a dipole matrix element, which is to say by sending a microwave, it's kind of easy to drive in a coherent way, a microwave transition, a radio oscillation between those two states. So this is such an example on a single atom, single Rydberg atom on this oscillation, the atoms having been prepared in state P and which goes to state F after some time. So now if we just take two of such atoms and place them close to each other, I mean, what can happen is this kind of interaction, which is called the resonant dipole interaction. So one atom can be in state P, the other one in state S, and uh, what happens is that under the drive and the influence of the dipole interaction, one goes down while the other one goes up. So this is exactly this flip-flop type of interaction that I described earlier in the case of the XY model, where you've got an exchange of a P excitation between the two atoms. And the strength of this interaction is d square over RQ. So of course, I'm using here the language of P excitation. I could as well use the language of spins, and I will actually use the two uh, in the in the what is going to come, so I mean S would be ground state and P would be uh, sorry S would be spin down and P would be a uh, spin up. Okay, so uh, can we see that in the lab? Yes, just take two atoms separated by a given distance in two tweezers. The distance here is thirty micrometers, which is a very very large distance. 
and place one atom in state S, the other one in state P, and measure after a given interaction time what your their final state. And what you observe, this kind of oscillatory behavior here for the first atom, which is in phase opposition with the oscillatory behavior of the second atom. So this is this coherent spin exchange or, or P exchange uh, between the two atoms on a time scale, which is short. And it takes like a microsecond, even for two atoms separated by 30 micrometers. And the, 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 the frequency here is directly given by the C3 over R3. So now uh, this is a dipole interaction. So dipole interaction is inesotropic and I'm leaving a bit, a few details, but essentially if the orientation of the dipoles, uh, sorry, the orientation of a quantization axis uh, make an angle theta with respect to the internuclear axis, then you expect this interaction to be inesotropic with a C3 coefficient, which should vary as a function of the angle as we learned in classical ENM for dipoles, one minus three cosine square theta. So essentially what we do, we measure the frequency of these oscillations for various configuration, various angles with respect to a given axis. And we observe this kind of polar plots, which is just the frequency and together with the theory. And you do see that it does follows uh, nicely this angular pattern. Importantly, there is one angle, which is this kind of magic angle at 55 degrees or close, where the C3 coefficient exactly vanishes. And it's going to be important in what's going to come. So now we can look at this uh, idea of uh, P ex uh, exchange uh, in the following uh, way. So we're going to use a different mapping. I can see, well, at least a P, uh, at the end, a P excitation is like a particle which hopes from site A to site B. And so I can use a completely different language and saying now I'm looking at single particle physics. So the interaction leads to single particle physics of a P excitation, which is my particle, hoping from one site to another one. And I'm going to use this in order to implement an elementary topological model. And the one we're going to uh, implement it is one dimensional Su Schrieffer Eger model, to, which was introduced in the 70s in order to explain the uh, electronic transport properties uh, in uh, organic uh, conductors, in organic uh, polymers, such as the polyacetylene. Here. So here we consider a chain of polyacetylene, so which is an alternance of strong and weak bound. Okay. And so initially it was introduced in the context of electronic transport. And now it turns out that this is one of the simplest examples of a topological model, as I will try to show uh, in a minute. So the, the modelization that uh, Su Schrieffer and Eger used is the following one. They, they started from two sub lattices, A and B, and they use a tight binding approach together with a demarized uh, approximation, which is to say that at the end, atom A is coupled to atom B with a strong link or a weak link. The thing which is very important is that they impose, and it turns out that in the model, there is an important feature of having no interaction within a subchain. And if you have this, it's called a sublattice symmetry. It leads to a symmetric single particle spectrum with respect to zero. I will illustrate that uh, now. So let's actually consider this kind of finer chain. So uh, this finer chain ending by a strong configuration, we can calculate what are the eigenenergies in this chain and what we find is this configuration. So I have essentially five dimers and I have 10 states that uh, gathers in two bands with the width of the band being given by the strength of the weak interaction and the gap between the band being, being given essentially by the strong uh, interaction, the strong coupling. But of course, I could have started the chain in a different way. I could have started the chain with the weakest link here. In which case, what happens is that exactly within the gap, you would have the appearance of two states that corresponds to H state, which is to say state at zero energy. It means that adding an excitation here costs no energy. It's kind of obvious it's J prime is equal to zero. It turns out because I mean, of course, it's not coupled to the rest, which would be the bulk, but it turns out to be also true in case J prime is not zero. And it turns out that actually those two different configurations are topologically non-equivalent in the sense that you cannot switch from the first to the second one without closing the gap. Because if you want J prime to become small, you need to increase this in such a way that it becomes larger than J. So you close the gap. So this is the reason why this model features topology. So now we're going to implement that in the lab using this kind of mapping of uh, spin exchange, which corresponds to a single particle moving from one side to another. So in order to do that, we want to implement once again, the normal untopological phase, 
uh, if having imposed this uh, condition of no coupling with endochain. And so this is exactly where using this uh, inisotropic resonant interaction is important because there is this magic angle for which you do not have any interaction between the dipoles. So now if your two sublattices are created by two chains of Rydberg atoms that are exactly at the magic angle, you do not have any interaction within a subchain, but you do have interaction between the subchain, which can alternate between strong and weak. And just by moving one atom from example, for, for example, this one from here to here, we move from one configuration to the other configuration, having preserved the sublattice symmetry. So let's try to see uh, that we have implemented the salient feature of this model by doing the microwave spectroscopy of this system. So we start with the atoms all prepared in the lowest Rydberg state, to so the state S. And we add a microwave and we see at which frequency we can add an excitation in the system. And so, uh, I mean, we will start first by the normal phase. So essentially what you have here is the result of the experiment. So what you have uh, in uh, X is the number of sites. So you've got 14 sites, which corresponds to the 14 atoms here. You've got the microwave detuning here. And the third axis, which is this color code, corresponds to the probability to excite the atoms to the P state. What you see that this light color here indicates the fact that we are able to access this lowest band here. Then there is no excitation, which is kind of normal because there is the gap. And in principle, we should have this, but it turns out that for symmetry reasons, they are very weakly coupled by the microwave. So we hardly see them. But what is important is to contrast that with what we have if we work in the topological configuration. And in this case, you still have the lowest band, but you do see exactly in the middle of the gap, the appearance of two states that are localized right on the edge. Those are the two edge states that I was referring to and that are supposed to be there. So I mean, if I just do a cut along this axis, you would see that indeed the two frequencies are degenerate, which sign the, the symmetry of the gap, uh, of the, the, the spectrum with respect to zero. We can even break this chiral symmetry to see whether we've got the, the good control just by moving one atom away from the magic angle. So we just take this final atom here, put it away from the magic angle and see when we do the spectroscopy what happens. And indeed, we do see that now the spectrum is no longer symmetric, which is to say that this state has higher energy than the other one. So it means that with this, we have implemented all the important features of the SSH model, at least at a single particle level. So now, uh, in all these questions of topology, uh, what is really the challenging questions those days is to go beyond the single particle physics and trying to understand the interplay between the topological nature of the structure and the interactions between the atoms. And here I'm going to be, uh, to disappoint many of you because I'm not going to give you any details. It's actually a talk in itself just to discuss that. But I'm just going to give you a flavor of why you can access the many body regime and why it is an interacting regime. So once again, we use this mapping of a spin excitation as a particle. It turns out that actually those particles interact. They interact very bizarrely because they interact like hardcore bosons. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if I have two atoms that are already excited, so two up excitation that come together, because there is no third state here, this hoping process is no forbidden. So it's as if it would take an infinite amount of energy to put the two atoms, the two excitation at the same place. So it's an infinite on-site interactions. And there is a mapping of this spin excitation onto an ensemble of hardcore bosons. And so now what we've done experimentally in this single, uh, in this SSS chain was to add more and more excitation in this system in order to observe important uh, features of the, actually the ground state of this SSH model. And we've done that in exactly the same spirit as what we've done for the adiabatic sweep in the Ising model that I have discussed. So we vary adiabatically the strength of uh, the, the Rabi frequency and the detuning, and we can add one by one the excitation in the system. And it turns out that when we have filled half the chain, we have prepared a very interesting uh, state, which is called a symmetry protective topological phase. So if you don't know what it is, it's not going to enlighten you. Uh, essentially, this is the only possible topological order that you can have in one dimension. And it was a bit unexpected, actually, that uh, we could reach this. I mean, these states have been pre uh, pre uh, proposed only in 2012, and they had never been seen. And here, it's an example of a phase that you can access to using this uh, platform 
of uh, Rydberg atoms interacting by the resonant dipole dipole interactions. Okay, so here, uh, this is all I wanted to say about the topology. So the current work or what we've been working on uh, recently on this is trying to extend the topology, key, the topology to two dimensions. So one thing we would like to see is the equivalent of this H state in the SS chain, but now in 2D, they would look like current. So we would put an excitation and this excitation should never enter the core, the bulk of this array, but only live on the outside. So those are simulations done by Hans-Peter Büchler. And here you need a critical ingredient in order to observe that, which is a spin orbit coupling. And it turns out that very recently on a suggestion by Hans-Peter Büchler, we have implemented on the experiment using the resonant dipole interaction, the spin orbit coupling. So you can see more details here. So I mean, it kind of hopefully will lead us to explore topology in 2D in the many body regimes uh, or not. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say about the Rydberg physics. Okay, and so in the next uh, seven, eight minutes uh, that I have, maybe uh, I will move to the optical dipole, but uh, do you want me to take maybe questions at this stage? Uh, I could, no? Okay, so let me move to uh, the last part. So the last part is again trying to deal with the resonant dipole-dipole interactions in different contexts. And the context is the context of light scattering. So we discussed this resonant dipole-dipole interaction as an exchange process. So I told you, okay, the first atom is in the excited state, the low one in the ground state, and they exchange their states with a flip-flop Hamiltonian. And here the VDD that we had discussed was only depending upon the interparticle distance. It turns out that this is not the full truth. There are actually two length scale in the problem. The first length scale is indeed the interparticle distance, but there is a second length scale in the problem, which is the wavelength associated to the transition. Okay? And so now you can have two different regimes. The first one is if the two atoms are close with respect to the wavelength, so R is much smaller than the optical, than the wavelength here. And in this case, indeed, the wavelength drops from the problem and you can uh, take the electrostatic expression that we've already used and uh, monitor this coherent interaction that we uh, discussed. And this is naturally the regime that we operate with Rydberg atoms because on a, on a Rydberg transition, the transition is in the gigahertz range, which is to say that the wavelength is in the millimeter or centimeter range. And as a consequence, two atoms separated by a few micrometers are in the near field of each other. But obviously, you can work in a regime where the interparticle distance is on the order of the wavelength. And in this case, the expression is much more complicated. It features different terms that you can have from electromagnetism. It's like a radiating dipole, if you wish, a near field term, a far field term, which is this one over R, scattering term we learn in EMM, and this kind of intermediate term and this kind of phase factor. So the thing which is important to realize now is that the wavelength does come into play through the k-vector associated to the transition, but also that there are an i coming in. So it's a complex number, So which is to say that the Hamiltonian here becomes non-Hermitian, and that signs the fact that we are dealing with a dissipative spin model. And here, all the more interesting, this dissipation is collective because it's actually the imaginary part of this complex number. And it turns out that now, if you have r on the order of 1 over k, for example, you can have the real and imaginary part. So real is the interaction, imaginary is the collective dissipation to be on the order of the line width of the transition. And so now, of course, if you operate an optical transition for atoms separated by a few micrometers, you should be able to see this kind of physics. So here it's a dissipative spin model with a new ingredient in which are the photons, the photons or to say, to, so to speak, the light. So let me revisit this idea of light scattering in dense media through those eyes. So essentially, if I just take a collection of atoms, shine light on it at a given frequency, what happens? Well, I mean, it can be that one atom is excited and release its energy in the electromagnetic vacuum, and this is done at a rate gamma. But based on this idea that there is an exchange interaction, an other output or decay channel for the atom is the exchange with a nearby atom. And in this case, the interaction becomes collective because all atoms participate to the scattering collectively. You can have a classical picture of this. I mean, it's as if you were looking at scattering in the presence of interactions between the light-induced dipoles. And people have looked at that a lot in the recent years uh, with, I mean, um, people have looked at that since the beginning of electromagnetism, but I mean, there were a renewed interest in um, 
in experiments recently with a more controlled system, I would say, uh, using like hot vapors, dense cold, uh, dense uh, cloud of cold atoms. I mean, we've done that in our group, but also a lot of efforts on dilute cloud of cold atoms uh, with large optical density. And all this was done in random and so on. So the atoms are positioned randomly. So we did see all of uh, these experiments saw some effects, but the idea now is trying to enhance the collective response by structuring the array. So the idea is the following. If I go back to this uh, dipole-dipole interaction that I've written, I have again this, let's say, one over R term, and there was this phase factor. So now it means that if I am in a random ensemble, all these phase factors are somehow going to interfere randomly, which is to say, to uh, lead to a very weak uh, effect. But now if you structure the array, the phase factor can now interfere constructively, if you wish, and you enhance the collective uh, scattering. So in one dimension, you can imagine that these dipoles can have orient in different, uh, with different relative phase with respect to each other and interact. And this leads to a strong, uncontrollable, eventually, a collective effect. So you can have different configuration of those dipoles. They can be either all in phase, in which case the entire array is going to scatter collectively with uh, exhibiting super radiance, which is to say with a decay rate, which is enhanced with respect to a single atom. Or they can be actually in phase opposition in such a way that the entire structure hardly decay, hardly scatters. And this is called subradiance. And there is this nice prediction uh, by Derek Chong and many others, actually, that if the interparticle spacing is below lambda over 2, you should have a lot of this subradiant mode that would actually correspond to guided mode of uh, the chain, where only uh, at the edge can the energy exit the system. And recently, this idea have been extended to 2D. I mean, both theoretically, but they were, uh, there was a very nice experiment in 2D in the group of uh, the Max Planck or Emmanuel Brock, where they used these ideas uh, to create some atomic, atomically thin mirrors. And, and the, the paper just came out. OK, so in the last two slides, I will show you uh, what we've done and bleed along these lines. So we've tried to create a one-dimensional chain. And again, we use optical tweezer, but just one this time. And we retro-reflect partially the light of the optical tweezer. The optical tweezer ensures the transverse confinement, and the optical lattices ensures some kind of regularity along the preparation of the tweezer. And in there, we could place an uh, ensemble of individual atoms at random. So the thing which is specific to our setup is that we could change dynamically the waist of the beam. And in this way, we can change the length of the chain because the waist is related to the relay distance to the square of the, the waist. And this is an example of a fluorescence image uh, taken transversely with a high NA uh, lens here. So you see a chain of atoms, about uh, 100 atoms, with a resolution which is about two sides. And so we cannot resolve the sides uh, one by one, but you do see this chain. And if we uh, take a waist which is slightly larger, you can take a chain which is slightly longer. So we we'll all did. Typically, we have about 200 sites. They are filled with about 50% filling fraction. And therefore, we handle about 100 atoms. And so what we look in this chain is the collective scattering on this uh, chain of atoms with the idea in the long term to see all these uh, subradians that I've told you. The typical interparticle distance here is on the order of the wavelength of the light. And so we use rubidium again. And we've done the spectroscopy. So we shine the laser on this chain of atoms either transversally or along the lattice chain. And we measure at 90 degrees the light which is scattered as we vary the detuning of the laser. What we observe is that if we shine the light in the transverse direction, essentially we've got this Laurentian profile, which is hardly shifted with respect to a single particle. While if we shine the light longitudinally, we do see that there is a shift towards the blue of the line. What we can also uh, see is we can also measure the position, uh, the, the spectrum at each position along the chain and measure the spectrum. And for each of them, measure the shift uh, with respect to uh, the, the reference. And what we observe is that indeed there is a growing shift as we move along the lines in the direction of the laser. And so I'm not going to give you too many explanations about that, just to give you a feeling that this is indeed due to collective scattering. So in a sense, what we are looking at here is the cumulative actions of the dipole-dipole interactions as you move along the chain. So essentially, this shift is given by the sum of all the contribution of the previous atom through these dipole-dipole interactions 
to the collective shift, uh, to, the co to the collective line, that, that gen shift the line by an amount which you can kind of calculate and which is on the order of gamma divided by this. But as it is cumulative, despite the fact that the atoms are pretty far from each other, you do have a measurable shift at the end. So what we've been uh, working, what we are working on now is trying to uh, increase our experimental capabilities in order to reach a uh, sub lambda arrays with the hope to see some subradiance and now to also access the many body physics, which is to say to place many of the excitations in these systems. And there, there were some nice prediction that the system should fermionize, for example, and we would like maybe to access this regime. So this is all I wanted to say uh, about this. So I just come to uh, the conclusion, uh, hoping that I've convinced you that this kind of platform that combines arrays of atoms and dipole interactions allows you to explore many body physics in situations that are non-trivial. You can have topology, you can investigate out of equilibrium, phase diagram, quantum phase transition. Now we start to have access to the control dissipative regime. And also when you handle uh, optical dipole, it's a nice atom light interface where you look at the collective response of the system to the light that you send onto it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'd be happy to take questions uh, if you have. Antoine, congratulations on the nice results and thank you for a great talk. Um, we do have some questions. I'll start with the SSH model. Yep. Um, so Chu Yu Zhang asks, what's the limit of the system size uh, which you can prepare for the SSH chain? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, so it's okay, it's all limited essentially, um, and it's kind of silly, by the size, the waste of the laser we use to do the red berry excitation. So essentially, chain we can do pretty long ones. If you got your excitation laser along uh, the chain, there is no problem. You can do uh, two chains very close by that can be, uh, let's say, 100 atoms long, uh, essentially. The problem is that if you want to implement this SSH model, you need to tilt the chain with respect to uh, the direction of the quantization axis, essentially. And so that uh, means that the chain cannot be too long, otherwise we exit the waste of the laser beam. But typically, it should be realistic to say we may be able to reach 30, which is already uh, pushing a bit far. But so that's kind of what we could do. Mm -hmm. um, you think Chen from the uh, Vuletic group um, asks about the spectrum of the edge states. You remember you showed the uh, symmetric and asymmetric configurations. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, regarding the width, what determines the spectral width of uh, the uh, measurements? Sorry. Too quick. So I guess you are talking about the widths here. Okay, yes. these widths, so it looks large actually, and it does, it is, and it's limited by the power spectrum burning of the microwave. So it's as silly as that. If we had more time to probe, we wouldn't be able to narrow uh, this line. Maybe a related question from Bill Phillips. Um, in the non-topological configuration here on the left, uh, can you say more about not exciting the upper band? It seems to be even less excited than the gap. This is actually true. And the reason for this is there is a symmetry of the state that you have here, that makes them, actually I'm going to use the language of subradiant, actually it's an alternance on plus or minus, so they do couple very weakly to the microwave because of this. So it's kind of a fundamental reason associated to the symmetry of the state in this second width. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's not that uh, we, I mean, if we had enough time, we would be able ultimately to populate them, uh, but it's just that the coupling is very weak. So it's not a problem of, let's say, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, so that's the reason why experimentally we don't see that. So actually, if you, if you mention time, uh, I have a question from Sebastian. Yes. Uh, so Sebastian asks, when you study frustration in 2D, but also maybe in 1D, uh, yes. it will necessarily slow down the dynamics. Um, do you think you will uh, run uh, into limitations due to the uh, lifetime of the... Um, Okay, so uh, that's an excellent question. So we've got lots of data on the triangle and uh, that we are trying to understand. <laughs> um, it seems that we can reasonably easily observe uh, a phase with one third filling and that the gap do not seem to be a problem. And to tell you the truth, it's a bit of a mystery to me because I mean, there is this saying that the gaps are supposed to scale exponentially in the case of a frustrating uh, system. And somehow it doesn't seem to be worse in our case by much than what we have for a square. So this is still something we're looking at. I mean, Andreas is doing actually some kind of heavy calculation trying to understand a bit more uh, this. 
it brings me to another related question. I mean, it's actually answering your question again, but what is kind of the natural time scale we have access to? I mean, when we do all these experiments, all the traps are off. So the entire structure we are dealing with is in free flight. And so it's ultimately limited by the residual motion of the atoms. And typically, the, the temperature of the atom is kind of cold. It's about three, two to three micro Kelvin. So it's almost frozen, the structure, for about 10 microseconds. So that kind of set the stage of how long we can be. So, I mean, that's true that to, to reach full adiabaticity, it's out of the rich forest. I mean, we, we don't have enough time to reach that. So it's kind of a compromise. Uh, yeah. Um, so maybe I'll uh, move to the uh, dipole uh, part. Uh, so again, Yu Ting Chen from the Village Group asked, uh, would you please comment on the connection of this project with Dickie's original proposal for superradiance, similarities and differences? And yes. by the way, he notes that it's cool that your lab has four aspheres aligned to the same spot. And I joined this comment. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so uh, how is it related to Dicke? So one has to be very careful when people speak about super radiance, uh, because there is a lot of usage of this word and in very different contexts. I mean, the initial work of Dicke is take a sub lambda ensemble. So all the spins, all the atoms are very close to each other uh, with a volume which is uh, much smaller than lambda. And you excite all of them to the excited state. And therefore, what you should end up is to see uh, the super radiant behavior, super radiant flash of a phasing of all these dipoles, which results into a flash of light which is emitted at a rate which is faster than a single atom. But it's not a non exponential decay. The problem is that it was very much uh, very soon after because. Uh, prediction realized that in the presence of dipole-dipole interaction, and you cannot neglect the dipole-dipole interaction because they are the imaginary part, uh, sorry, the real part of the imaginary uh, uh, VDD, which is the one that uh, is at the origin of superradiance. And what uh, it turns out that this should actually kill or at least heavily suppress the superradiance predicted by Dicke. And as a matter of fact, the superradiance predicted by Dicke in Dicke's quantification has never been observed because uh, first people could not put all the atoms uh, within lambda, at least on an optical transition. And second, because most likely it's difficult. The people have realized recently by doing more involved calculation that the suppression is not total. It's, uh, it's just, it's a partial suppression of the super radiance. And we do hope to be able to see that for uh, uh, interparticle distance on the order of lambda over 10, if we can reach that, but that's a bit challenging. So. So I don't know if it clarifies. And so the kind of super radiance I was uh, discussing here, the super radiance when you place only one excitation in a symmetric state. And in this case, the, the, this uh, shared excitation decays exponentially at n times gamma. But it's different from the one of decay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Antoine, what's the prospect of um, uh, getting to 100% filling fraction for, uh, uh, for uh, say, a lattice with 780? with half of 780 nanometer spacing. Um, okay, so the, you mean in the last part, so yeah, I missed the, yeah. the last thing you said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the prospect is, uh, I would say it's bright, of course, uh, but it's more involved experimentally. So the idea would be to combine uh, this uh, tweezer array in order to load an optical lattices and then use some kind of accordion to squish the lattices. So in this case, you would end up in principle with a fully filled array. I mean, needless to say, it's an extra optical complications. Uh, so, I mean, lots of uh, experimental uh, issues and uh, alignment nightmares for the PhD student, but honestly, I think it should be feasible. The, the thing I kind of like about optics, as an aside, <laughs> is the fact that each time I thought we would be limited, I mean, uh, optics is really able to do absolutely amazing thing. I mean, these SLM, these arrays and things. Uh, th this, so we've never been stopped by the optics. It's more or less challenging, but so far we've never encountered an ultimate limit. So, so I'm kind of hopeful that we should be able to do that. So, well, Maybe I'll, uh, I'll finish with a uh, kind of a more bigger perspective question. Um, how do you see the balance of opportunities, uh, uh, say, between many body physics and quantum simulations uh, with Rydbergs compared to uh, going to digital quantum computing? Uh, uh, to, to digit, okay. Um, so that's true that those Rydberg platforms, they are kind of naturally suited to implement analog uh, quantum simulations or kind of annealing if we speak more about uh, quantum information. Uh, the thing which is fair to say is that now there are uh, first the, the, the demonstration by the group of Lukin uh, in Harvard of very high fidelities 
and the entanglement of two Rydberg atoms, uh, and also of gates, and even of uh, Toffoli gates, uh, with pretty high fidelity. So I would say that now the Rydberg platform is back on track uh, as a good candidate for uh, quantum information processing tasks. On top of that, there is the, and, and the, the, the platform of Misha Lukin is uh, one which is based on rubidium. So essentially it's the same atom as what we have. On top of that, there is this very nice work uh, by Manuel Andres in particular, but there is also Adam Kaufman and Jeff Thompson where they are using group two atoms. And there, um, Manuel uh, has uh, put on the archive and published last year, a very nice paper where the fidelity of entanglement is extremely high actually. So they could create a Bell pair with 99.7% uh, fidelity, which is, so I don't have in the top of my head the latest number for the ions, but it's, it starts to be pretty competitive. Whether it's impossible to reach that with rubidium, I don't know. I mean, there is a lot of advantage uh, associated to the group two atoms, which do not seem to be impossible to reach with alkali, but uh, I don't know. So um, we are for sure uh, trying a bit on our side, but that's not our main effort in the group because this is really demanding to, to crank up these uh, fidelities. So. Well, Antoine, thank you very much. Thank you for the talk and thank you for agreeing, accepting our invitation. Thank you. And thank I'll you. hand over to Sebastian now. Thank you also from my side, Antoine. This was a really cool and uh, far-reaching overview of what's going on currently. And um, I would like to announce that next week on July 30th, we will have another talk, of course, by uh, Anna Maria Ray, who will be speaking about dynamical phase transitions. And uh, also, you should note that uh, Anna Maria's talk will be the last before our summer break in August. There will be no quantum science seminar in August, but we will start again on September 3rd. If you want to know uh, more about what we're doing, if you want to get notified, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. Uh, you should subscribe to our email list. You should uh, subscribe to the Google Calendar we have, and you should follow us on Twitter. And you should certainly check out our sister seminar, the AMO seminar, where tomorrow uh, Norman Yao will actually speak about emergent hydrodynamics in spin systems, another talk related to spin systems like we heard today. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye.